Hey folks, welcome back to Heart Gold vs. Crystal. We are here in Olivine City, and uh, we're actually looking at Crystal for once, which is unusual. Um, Crystal's kind of gotten less screen time since it's it's only really for plot events and things like this, um, wherein I get a strength DM at a different place, or HM rather. Um, and just, just to kind of say things about that, I'm okay with that. You don't really care that every time I fight a poison type, I have to not use Bree in Crystal. That's one pretty well established, and you don't need to see every single minute difference. So I'm, I'm okay to kind of relegating it to important or difficult battles. If you want to see more Crystal, go play Crystal yourself, for, for goodness sake. If you haven't played it enough in the past ten years. But anyway, um, getting strength there rather than a Mount Mortar, teaching it to Klaus just as before, and now we're heading to the Olivine Lighthouse, uh, which is a dungeon in a town that isn't a cave. It's a little crazy. And now, one thing I wasn't actually aware of, um, and I'm not sure when it was added to the canon or whatever, uh, is that this is actually called the Glitter Lighthouse don't know where it's actually referred to as the Glitter Lighthouse, other than maybe, like, is there a sign in front of it or something? But the label says Lighthouse, everyone just refers to it as the Lighthouse, so I call it the Olifine Lighthouse, I don't know. Um, but anyway, it's... I, I call it a dungeon, but it's not really a dungeon. I think to be a dungeon it needs to have either wild Pokemon or some form of non-linearity. Has neither, so yeah, it's, it's a linear progression of, of trainers, but it's a good place to train, so I'll roll with it. The one trainer I always remember from this dungeon is this first guy with a Noctowl, because you don't see too many Noctowl in the game, and Noctowl are pretty rad. I don't know, I, I just always remember him. It may be entirely because he's the first trainer in the dungeon, but... Mm -hmm. well, that's, 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 that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And I'm all about the personal pointless an anecdotes right here. Anyway, getting his phone number, because uh, I think that knocked out was going places. Anyway, um, this is another one of those wonderful trainer-filled episodes, because people really like seeing trainer fights. That's That's about it. Um, anyway, let's let's look at this guy. It's Poliwag. Um, Poliwag... I like Poliwag. I don't know, the interesting thing is really more is, is Poliwhirl, which is coming up next. Um, I talked a little bit about Poliwhirl in the previous episode, uh, when, when Webster was fighting one, and kind of how Webster is a lot better at fighting them than a lot of my other Pokemon. Um, because Webster is Insomnia, and the... Poliwhirls of the of the world love to use hypnosis, as you can see there. Um, insomnia prevents hypnosis from working. It seems to work out pretty well. Frida, unfortunately, her best move requires a charge up turn, so Poliwhirl is basically guaranteed to get the hypnosis in, and Frida won't be able to do any damage with Solar Beam. So despite having the type advantage, not so great. O eventually, I think I'll, I'll wisen up. And, and use Bullet Seed rather than, than Solar Beam. Man, Solar Beam's so satisfying. Anyway, a little bit of trivia about Poliwhirl, now that we've seen Poliwag and Poliwhirl right up against each other. Um, the, the spiral on, on their stomachs changes direction when Poliwag evolves into Poliwhirl. And I remember this because the, like, the Scholastic official Pokemon handbook or whatever um, had that as trivia on the back cover but said that Poliwhirl evolved into Poliwag, which is, is, is blatantly false. And that confused my young mind so much I wasn't... I, I didn't know up from down. I it Eventually it was all sorted out when I lost the book. But um, the, the, the thing about the spiral to... to elaborate on that, uh, is that Poliwhirl and Poliwrath uh, share the same direction of the spiral. Poliwag and Politoad share the same direction of the spiral. So, 
it's entirely possible that it would change directions twice if, if you were to evolve it from Hollywag to Whirl to Toad. Anyway, um, I don't know if we're ever, ever gonna see a Politoed in this playthrough. I feel like I'm sure there, there must be an NPC somewhere that has one, but heck if I know where one is, and I, I don't know, I don't know if it would be worth seeking one out, but in case I never have the opportunity, Politoed, in addition to being more like a toad than a frog, has multiple toes. Holly Toad. Mind freak. Okay. Um. But anyway, Holly Toad's pretty cool. But just, just putting that out there. Anyway, that takes care of Holly World. I used Bullet Seed because that's a smart thing to do. I hope I never have to deal with hypnosis hacks. I will. Anyway, like I said, lighthouse here. It's it's linear. You go around in circles, but it is linear. And that's actually one thing that I... Say, saying circles reminded me. Um, I, I do like the aesthetic design of the lighthouse, especially in fourth generation. Um, in second generation, it was a bunch of square floors, basically. Um, it had walls and, and weird paths, but it was, it was a bunch of square floors. In, in fourth generation, it has a square base, then it gets circular, uh, or cylindrical rather, um, when you get to a higher level. So you saw that previous floor was rectangular, and now we got, like, circles. It's cool, it's neat. Uh, especially since you don't see a whole lot of circles in, in the Pokemon series. It's just, that's not how their tile sets generally work, especially since you're, you're based on a, uh, grid-based system. So you don't, you don't see many circles. And it's, it's a nice, uh, change of aesthetic. It does make it seem very, very claustrophobic, I think. And if this were a more atmospheric game, that could be used to great effect. Anyway, we're fighting Bird Keeper. The thing about the... Well, it's a lighthouse, so you, you go up, and it's in the sky, and birds like that. Never mind that it's a claustrophobic cylinder that birds probably wouldn't enjoy being in. I don't really know. Um, but I would like to complain or, or rather, praise this game and complain about other Pokemon games. Um, since we're talking about lighthouses, did you know that there are actually two lighthouses in, um, the Hoenn games? Think really hard. There's one in Slateport, there's one in Lily Cove, and there's probably another one I'm, I'm forgetting. There's probably one in Moss Deep, and I don't even know. Um, but the point is, there's such just minor... Aesthetic little. They're not even set pieces. I can't even qualify them as set pieces because there's no attention drawn to them. They're not visually impressive. You can walk by them and not even realize that they're lighthouses. Um, so it's it's lame, is what I'm saying, and this is really cool. Um, and then you can also contrast it with the uh, other fourth generation games, Diamond, Pearl, Platinum, where there is a lighthouse that you enter. But you enter it, you go up an elevator, and you talk to the dude at the top, and then you leave, and there's nothing in there. Which is, is also pretty boring. Uh, considering that it's in a, a city based entirely on electricity, you'd think that there could be some sort of interesting thing about a lighthouse, but... Nope. Not happening. So, yeah, this is a, a good example of having a set piece making it a big deal, integrating it into the game design. Because it's a port town, it would make sure it would make sense to have a lighthouse of some sort. But it's a thing. They made use of their resources, and since it was like a second generation game on, on a Game Boy cartridge, they didn't they couldn't do too too many impressive things. So it, it's a good opportunity to take a building, make it into a dungeon. And here look, it's a growlith. Oh, that's pretty bad. And now it's dead. Anyway, I'm not really talking a whole lot about the trainers, because the trainers are, are basically there to give you easy experience. Um, since we are coming up on the 
Well, we're already in the second half of Johto, where things are supposed to get difficult. So hey, have some experience to make it less difficult. Um, but they're also there to make the dungeon feel less empty, because there are no wild Pokémon and there are no puzzles. There was actually one almost puzzle in the original, where you had to drop down a hole and then climb up a ladder in order to progress, but that wasn't really a lot. I wish there were more puzzle dungeons in this game. Those, the last thing we had quote that resembled a puzzle was the far-fetched thing in Ilex Forest. We will have a little bit in an upcoming uh, cave, but that's not enough. Anyway, I'll see you for the rest of the lighthouse after this commercial break. Anyway, now we have a neat little uh, change of scenery here. Um, unlike in the original games, where it's just all tower all the time, uh, we now have a little uh, breath of fresh air. And in fact, this is something that they don't do anywhere else in the fourth generation. Um, it's just it, it's a slight change of camera. You see out into the distance. It's really neat. Um, it's a fact that they use a lot more frequently in the fifth generation games, but this, as far as I recall, is the only time where you see something like it uh, in a fourth generation game, and it's a very nice change of pace. However brief it is, um, it's well done. And it's neat, and it, and it sticks in my mind. It's clear that they were just showing off, but that's okay. Of course, unfortunately, as soon as we're you know, enjoying it. Time to go back in. Nothing to do out there besides grab the one item. And uh, we're confined to the inside for the rest of the episode, unfortunately. Now we're, we're fighting some Krabby. It's not even worth having a mirror match. Because what can these Krabby do? Look at this, I give them a free turn, and what do you think they do? Guess what they do. They use Harden. A foolish creature. They're, they're in the uh, the bottom percentage of all Krabby. I know so many Krabby better than them. I can name two off the top of my head. But yeah, they're, they're, they're weak. Well, like I said, they're there for experience. That's about it. Anyway, you can see over there there's actually one neat little thing. You got a map of the region. Not a particularly beautiful map, but it's neat all the same, and I don't know, it would have made a little bit more sense outside, where you can actually see the rest of the region, but it's still something that you might have in a tourist attraction like a lighthouse. No, this is an active lighthouse rather than a tourist attraction, but, you know, whatever. Um, anyway, more, be more, more bird keepers. This one has Spiro rather than Pidgey truly a force to be reckoned with. I don't know, I, I, I used a Fero in my, my first playthrough of Heart Gold, it worked out. But look at this, I'm, I'm using a ground type against a flying type and I'm trumping it. What has the world come to? Actually, I'll, I'll give this guy a pass because he does actually have an evolved form. He has a Fero. Like, I, I can't fault him. Too much, I guess. I, I would have preferred all Firo, but what are you gonna do? You're gonna ROM hack the game and fix everything. That's what you're gonna do. I know. I know you've done it. You. You right there. I know who you are. You've done this, and you'll never. You'll never live it down. But yeah. Fero goes down like any other normal normal uh, flying type by not using ground type moves like an idiot. I could also use rollout if I wanted to, but apparently I don't. Rollout would be super effective. Probably take care of them all in one shot, except maybe that first fear, uh, first Spiro. This is what you people want. This is what the people want. This is what the people have decided. This is a video by democracy. They want more fights. They want more action, no matter how repetitive. 
Anyway, let's all remember why we all remember Spiro. I would bet that 95% of you remember Spiro because you watched the first episode of the anime, uh, in which Spiro did horrible, unspeakable things to our favorite protagonists. Um, I, I know that's the only reason it sticks in my mind, other than it looks slightly more badass than a Pidgey. Anyway, we are nearing the end of the lighthouse. We only have two more trainers to go. Uh, and this is the point where I've officially run out of things to say about completely generic and forgettable trainers, so let's just skip them. And let's have probably the highlight of the lighthouse, photo time! It's not the most glamorous setting, but our previous photo was in, like, an underground tunnel. So, this is fine, we'll get, we'll get a good picture eventually. Um, but yeah. One, two sailors, that's all we need to worry about, and uh, they're nothing to worry about, so let's just grab the super repel and head on up the ladder, up to the final floor. Now this is a neat thing, I really like the idea of having Pokemon actually involved with the, with the infrastructure uh, of the city and of the world, and I also like Ampharos's name. I don't know if it's Ampharos or Ampharos, because I can't meet anyone who ag agrees on the pronunciation of the original lighthouse in Alexandria on which it's based. Um, but yeah, Amphi's sick, we need to get medicine from Cyanwood, let's get going. And now that, should, uh, that Jasmine has opened up that barrier, that gate, uh, we can now use the elevator up and down the entire lighthouse. In Crystal, there was no elevator. So, uh, that was a bit of a trip. But anyway, that takes care of the Glitter Lighthouse, and I will see you guys next time for a trip across the sea.